Hi, welcome along to another video. This week we're going to get into a, a book called The Weather Business by Dr. Bruce W. Atkinson. This book is from 1968, so it's 53 years old. We're going to look at Chapter 5, Weather Modification. We'll be covering the period from 1904 up to 1947, and we'll also cover 1947 up to the time of writing the book in 1968 and we'll go through it in bite-sized chunks and compare it to the 21st century 53 years later. What we'll see is that there is a lot of correlation between the info from back then to now which also then comes across as progression of the fields concerned. But first let's just take a look at who Dr Atkinson is. In 1968 Dr Bruce is a lecturer in geography at Queen Mary College, London University. His main interests are mesometeorology and urban climatology. He has published papers on thunderstorms and the effects of urban areas on rainfall. He is at present continuing research into this topic. And to bring you up to date, Dr. Bruce is prof now Professor Bruce Atkinson, still at the Queen Mary University of London. So writing in 1968, Professor Atkinson opens the chapter on weather modification with Much has been written in the past 20 years, so between 1947-48 and 1968, much has been written in the past 20 years on the possibilities of weather modification, and many of the early writers were a little too optimistic about what could be done. The fact that even now we can only hope to forecast the weather in any detail up to three days ahead should serve as a warning that our understanding of the atmospheric circulations is still so limited as to make conscious controlled modification of the weather over any area large or small very much a thing of the future so that last sentence very much a thing of the future we're now 53 years further on and we are very much in that future and a good example of that would be the cloud seeding upgrade provided by the UAE as shown in the image. There is a link to this article in the information section of this video. And so we continue with the book. It is not however unreasonable for the physical scientists who study the atmosphere to hope that one day they will have some control over what goes on in their outdoor laboratory. So worth considering there in 1968, and in some ways you could say the same is the same today, that scientists consider that there is an outdoor laboratory. That's the land you walk on every day. There's the indoor laboratory that has nothing to do with you. There's the outdoor laboratory that you have to walk around in, and so does everyone else. And that's the attitude in 1968. It's, it really was, and it is today. People like David Keith at Harvard University prove that regularly. And now we pick up with the book again. After the professor speaks about cloud seeding, he mentions a far more spectacular means of modifying weather is by nuclear explosion. Short-lived and comparatively local, but capable of releasing in one instant as much energy as is converted in the course of one thunderstorm. That's quite an interesting comment if you consider that there have been 2,624 nuclear explosions since the technology was developed as per 2016, 2016. If you look at the aftermath of Hiroshima and Nagasaki in 1945, you can see, especially knowing that hundreds of thousands of people died as the consequences of those two bombs. You can see from the destruction and from the loss of life exactly what nuclear bombs do. There's not really much more testing you can do with nuclear bombs than Nagasaki or Hiroshima. So if there was a further two and a half thousand tests, the coincidence theorist would naturally think that some of those were potentially not nuclear bomb tests, but actually weather modification experiments as the effects on the weather would have been seen after the bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 
scientific observations, if you like. So for a recap on the history up to the 19, late 1960s, in the period 1946 to the early 1960s, weather modification was synonymous with cloud seeding. And then Professor Atkinson says, the first period, 1911 to 45, is strictly pre-modification. And that doesn't mean there was nothing happening. That means experimentation. We've shown in plenty of videos before, in the International Weather Wars playlist, experiments were going on from 1906, and the commercialization took place through the 1950s, resulting in regulations and legislation being created throughout the 1960s. Professor Atkinson says the main source of material for this chapter on weather modification comes from a report entitled Weather and Climate Modification, published in 1966 by the United States National Research Council in Washington, D.C., the District of Columbia. We then get quite a telling statement. It is true that early investigators had rainmaking as their main aim, and it remains a major objective today. But redistribution of precipitation that would have fallen anyway is perhaps of equal importance. And there we see redistribution of precipitation. What Professor Atkinson is saying is someone is deciding somewhere how precipitation should be redistributed. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? He continues, his actual apparatus consisted of large eight meter towers with tanks of galvanized iron on top. The tanks were filled with iron trays containing chemicals believed to include copper sulfate. The trays were connected to the ground by copper wires that were said to carry electric charges. No indication was given of how the apparatus was supposed to produce rain, but Hatfield's luck seemed boundless. On nearly every occasion, rain did occur, sometimes in copious quantities. In one experiment at Medicine Hat Canada, the rainfall six days after erection of the structure totaled nearly three centimetres, and farmers began to ask Hatfield to turn it off. What jumps out there, of course, is that the trays on the towers were connected to the ground by copper wires that were said to carry electric charges. Metal structures, such as towers or antenna, carrying an electric charge, could easily be seen nowadays as a progression to what we understand as ionospheric heaters which are also known as harp facilities. Ever since the breakthrough in 1947, many tests have been carried out by different authorities. Most of the projects have been undertaken by American and Australian workers, usually with government support. But particularly in the United States, there has been a good deal of commercial exploitation of possible rainmaking methods. So a clear indication that Australia was at it as well. The professor continues, the most recent test project concerned with modifying cumulus clouds over fairly level terrain was undertaken by the University of Chicago. Project Whitetop, as it was known, was carried out in southern Missouri during the five summers of 1960-64 to and included carefully randomised seeding studies as well as measurements of cloud and precipitation parameters. One important way in which Project Whitetop differed from Project Cirrus was that the seeding in Whitetop was done with silver iodide, whereas dry ice was used in the earlier project, Project Cirrus. I hope that gave you some more information for your usage at any time and place. Take care, look after yourselves, and see you next time.